Okay, um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm delighted that you're here. Uh, I'm also delighted that Cheng Hua is here. Um, Cheng Hua, uh, in addition to being an excellent writer, um, is also a wonder no, yeah, <laughs> a wonderful scientist. Um, she's an associate professor uh, at the medical school uh, in the Department of Neurobiology. Her lab studies how the formation um, and function of, of the brain barrier um, affects various processes. She also explores how neural activity influences the development and function of the blood vessels that supply the brain. Uh, Cheng Hua is the recipient of research fellowships from the Sloan, Whitehall, Klingenstein, and March of Dimes Foundations and she's won the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. Uh, in 2016, she was selected as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute faculty scholar. Uh, in that capacity, she's among 84 early career scientists from 43 institutions across the U.S. who are being recognized for their great potential to make unique contributions to their field. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you've got all this information. <laughs> um, so, I'm very happy you're here. Thank, you, thank you for you. having me. Yes. Um, normally, she rides her bike. Tonight, she drove her car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I want to talk a little bit first just about your early experiences in China yeah. while you were still writing in Chinese uh -huh. and whether it was something that you enjoyed as a child or um, y whether you had influences and how that translated into your uh, plan to become a scientist. Mm. Okay. Uh, so first of all, you know, I was here last week with Steven Pinkers, so I felt like today's is a completely the other spectrum, right? To I'm more like among you guys, uh, still on the journey to be a good writer. So I'm happy to be here to share with you some of my um, past or the thoughts, plan for the future. Um, so I think we probably have more in common. <laughs> uh, yeah, so go back to Susan's question. Um, I think I felt like a, uh, writing in Chinese, maybe partially because you know you just you take the composition classes and you do the normal, you know, step with very short essays become like different style of essays. Even though it's in Chinese, I think you just kind of follow the 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 growth, the different steps. So to me, I actually really enjoyed that, uh, especially when I was in high school, I had a very good teacher who actually never really set so many um, rules, um, very encouraged you to write freestyle, and sometimes if you feel like you want to write very long articles, it's fine too. So I felt like during that period of time, I actually become more enjoying, um, become more and more enjoying writing. Um, so. I never thought it would be a struggle or anything. <laughs> what about <laughs> the shift to writing in English when, when you came to the US? Right, so that yeah. was a huge uh, hurdle, I feel. <laughs> um, because um, I, I think it's more about, um, I felt like uh, what I tried to express didn't really achieve its goal. Like I thought, oh, this is what I tried to say, but from people's reaction, I felt like it wasn't clear for sure because they didn't get it. Uh, so that was a little bit a uh, struggle. So what steps did you take at that point to say, okay, I need to do something. <laughs> People need to understand my work. Right. Because obviously there was, you published so many articles, there was a point at which people started understanding your work. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's more like why, why, drew, yeah. why I wrote my first draft. Yeah. It's not more like they don't understand, just like uh -huh. so wordy, yeah. very long. Um, uh -huh. Like uh, it, it, it's, there's a much simpler way to express your thought process. Um, so I think that, took me a very long time to realize it. So I, uh, it took me way more longer time than my colleagues to write an article to a point that is you know, clear and publishable. Did, in your early career writing 
in English, did your colleagues give you advice on the drafting process? Oh, and, yeah. yeah, yes. But I felt like mm -hmm. a, there's something you have to realize by yourself, right? It's like you have a conversation with somebody. Um, even now, I try to give advice to my students or something. Sometimes you felt like a, it's just not entering to the mind, right? So I think maybe my colleagues trying to tell me, oh, you know, this is the way you should do it. But until something clicked, you just don't quite get it, right? Especially how you turn that into action to actually make a difference. Um, what would you say was the moment that something clicked for you, that the writing started to work? I think in the beginning I'm trying to mimic. Yeah. I try to, you know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I feel like, oh, writing is such a serious thing, so I'm contemplating a lot in my head until I feel like, you know, the logic, the, the wording, everything is perfect, and then I start to write. That was a huge mistake. So I think my revelation is, mm -hmm. you know, um, just write down what your thought process is. Use anything, just like I'm talking to somebody, right? And then you go back, start to editing. And until I talk to some, my American-speaking, uh, English-speaking, you know, people, they they said even for them they write this way. It's not like they just write out perfect sentences first time. So I think that oh, that was a huge uh, that that start change. Uh, the way I, I write and also the amount of time would take me to write a good um, paragraph or I, a I think that's right. The first draft, as we've discussed, the only requirement for it is that it exists. Yeah. It can be absolutely terrible. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's simply the materials out of which you're going to build something. So it's as though you have a construction site and you're simply bringing lumber and bricks and other things to the site. Yeah. And then the, the work of shaping an actual construction only begins after you have the materials. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I felt like one way I learned is um, actually if you have a friend or somebody, you can have a conversation with that person um, just to kind of uh, uh, tell, tell the person about the logic, the flow of your, your writing, you know, will be. And then you simply just kind of uh, recapitulate this conversation in a way. Um, that, that w at least the logic was, has been taken care of. I think that's very important, especially for scientific writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's how you want to tell the story. The logic and the flow is there. And then a the matter of the, each paragraph or, e or the, each sentences, mm -hmm. then you can start to work on it. Can you say more about what you think the importance of writing is to your career as a scientist? I think it's super important. I, I felt like I suffered uh, from, you know, early stage not being a good writer. Uh, even now, I feel like uh, uh, sometimes I talk to my colleagues, I feel like I, I gain a huge amount of uh, insight or help how to make the same material sound much better, much more impactful. So it sounds like staying in conversation with your peers and always being willing to learn and recognizing that the first draft is going to be a mess yeah. and practicing some kind of self-acceptance about how bad the first draft is going to be, yeah. all these things. Yeah, and also I felt like a, um, uh, actually you should ask yourself to work on it many times before you give to someone. Um, so because actually if you put it on a site for a couple of days, you come back to it, you always realize this can be better. And I think only when you're doing those type of things, then you can actually improve. Um, so how many times would you say you go through a draft to make it better? I, I think <laughs> if you asked me two years ago, uh -huh. I probably not so many uh -huh. times, and I give to my colleagues or yeah. something. I think when you when you give to somebody not a perfect, not you know, you haven't tried push yourself hard enough. You know, no one can give you the op the best um, comment either, right? Because mm -hmm. there's so many problems that they they couldn't focus on particular one or two, right? Um, so I think now I I would do much much more. It depends on the time I have. 
uh, I think she got 10 times or something. Yeah. Like that. My, my, own, my own manuscript, like mm -hmm. even 25 times yeah. or 30 times. Um, I often find in discussion with students that they want to push themselves, but they're not sure what they should do to push themselves yeah. to make it better. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe, yeah. exactly, yes. that's why I, bring, I brought this book. I felt like uh, this is a revelation for me. It's, you see how thin, how small this book is, right? Um, it's called Style, The Basics of Clarity and Grace. Um, this is by uh, Joseph Williams and Joseph Bizup. So because I, this is about like two years ago, I, I, I said to myself, right, at least for my, I think most of you probably also, for scientific writing, especially nowadays, people's uh, attention time is like so short. So, so I think I, I just want my writing to cause minimal cerebral activity, cognitive <laughs> activity from my readers. So um, whatever the easiest for them to get it, that's my goal, right? So that requires has my writing has to be direct, concise, and uh, simple, direct, concise, what else? Um, clear, coherent. Clear, coherent, right? Yes. So it's very simple. So then I found this book. Um, it's incredibly helpful because that's exactly the goal of that. And, and, and that te teaches you how to go through the drafts to, to um, achieve those um, Four things. At the level of sentences. Yeah, at the level of the yeah. paragraph, the mm -hmm. sentences, and the whole um, whole article. Yeah. Um, um, so now we sound like an infomercial for this book. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but but I but I honestly I yeah. read a lot of um, yeah. writing books. I felt like this is the most helpful. I actually bought one for my lab, and I told all my students and postdocs to read it. Uh, even if you're good writer already, you still can learn something from this. Um, that's what about the usefulness of reading published articles by your colleagues? Mm -hmm. I know that you've sent me some yeah. articles that yeah. have been great. Yeah. Um, do in reading other people's work, have you learned important lessons about how to put your own work together. Yeah, yeah. I, but definitely. Yeah. Uh, I feel like it's more like after I read this book, I know what are the key elements or, you know, after you have those kind of information in your head, when you reread re -read the same article, you, you see things very differently, right? So then you start to analyzing those good examples. Why, why is read well? Why it delivered the message so clearly? So I felt like uh, uh, now I could actually um, use those examples to to kind of a model after, but mm -hmm. but with a purpose. Like before, it's more like I'm trying to create something similar, right? That's not the point. The mimicry. Yeah, the mimicry. Yeah. yeah. And now it's original. Yeah, now it's original, mm -hmm. and then also when you read something, you can appreciate. Uh, you, it's like you, you appreciate music, right? When you understand the structure of a classical music, and it's a different level of appreciation. Can you talk a little bit about some of the recent things that you've been doing to sort of raise your level of appreciation yeah. of English? So, yeah. yeah, so this is <laughs> another uh, revolution, especially if you're a foreigner, right? So this actually is through our dialogue, through our conversation. When I first met Suzanne, um, so she actually recommended to me to start listening to a book, audio books, instead of read a book, because in, when, when you listen to the books, the, the phonic, you know, the, because what, what's the difference between a foreigner versus if English is your first language is that we, we didn't grow up with listening to English sound, right? So um, it's almost like a retrain your brain in, in a way, you know, I'm a neuroscientist myself, right? And I have to say, it's, it's like a hugely, hugely helpful. Um, this whole year, I've already listened to like more than 10 books, and then some of them are very long and different things. So I felt like, uh, you know, it's the, the, when, I, when I read again, it starts to have a rhythm. So before my writing, that's another thing, it's very plain. Um, so, so now I, I get a sense of talking about appreciation, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you, it's just like you listen to music when you have, it's a different level, it's never ending, right? So now I feel like I have a, 
um, deeper type of appreciation of a good writing. And those books are also fantastic uh, examples. It's more like unconsciously uh, affecting me, mm -hmm. uh, which I like. Well, I think you've mentioned how now when you read your own work, right. you can sort of hear yes. what the next word yeah, should exactly. be. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So just to sum up what we've said thus far, um, appreciating the necessity of you know, at least five and, if possible, ten drafts. Um, and de depending on how much work there is to be done, um, acceptance of the length of the process, leaving time for that process to happen yeah. uh, in between the first draft and the time when you actually turn the paper in. And then a different kind of reading, using yes. published articles differently so that you're actually saying, how is this thing structured? Um, what things are they doing that make it work particularly well? And even if you're starting with how can I mimic these effects, you can move beyond that to an appreciation mm -hmm. um, and developing those strategies in your own voice. Um, also, the really fun part is, you know, it could be two articles published in the same journal, right? So now you look at them, right, and it's like a G, you know, the writing just could be like one that's so elegant and great and one that's just like, it's really not my role model, right? But they, they both conveying signs. Um, you know, this, if you're, you're within the field, obviously you, you get it, right? But just take much more effort for one than the other. Um, you, you can see the difference now, I feel. Well, you've spoken about how your desire as a child to understand the universe and to become a scientist is related to your desire to communicate your science as clearly as possible. Mm -hmm. But could you talk a little bit about your childhood and what inspired you to become a scientist? Uh, uh, I First of all, I think, um, so both of my parents are scientists. Um, they actually, uh, one grew up in Beijing, one grew up in Shanghai, and then they volunteered to Inner Mongolia to build an agricultural institute. And they stayed there for like 45 years or something, right? So I actually spent maybe four years when I was uh, between first grade and fourth grade there. Uh, so I, you know, see them doing science and this type of thing. And also, you know, just in that kind of totally different environment, uh, surrounded by nature, both, you know, all kinds of uh, agricultural stuff and animals and just everything like wilderness and also hang out with the local kids. Uh, so for me, I think that's the, uh, in, that's how I became interested in science and mm -hmm. curious about nature. So I felt like, a, uh, I'm here to, I feel like my mission is more like to c uncover the, the truth of the universe. It's more about, I want, I'm curious, I want to uncover what is the truth, not necessarily I want to change it or anything like this. I'm just, because I know what's out there. When I was really young, um, it's just like an um, endless love surprise, right? When you really dive into the nature. So mm -hmm. I think that kind of a curiosity probably the driving force of it. Uh, but when I was young, I never realized how important the communication uh -huh. is. I think now, also maybe because when you're older, you also have other things you, you want to share, you want to offer to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, not only your science, right? Your thought right. process, your ideas. Um, so I felt like it doesn't matter what you do, writing, be a good writer is such an important thing. So if you could go back and speak to your graduate student self yeah. and you could give some advice to your graduate student self, what, yeah. what would you advise I, yourself? I wish, I wish I started listening to those audiobooks earlier. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my first, because it's so enjoyable mm -hmm. also. Uh, and, and your and, comfort level with English, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's just so enjoyable and, and I, I felt the difference. I, I felt like a, 
that that was the missing part. Besides, mm -hmm. I'm doing all the hard work, like reading a book or mm -hmm. or actually working on the writing, right? So that was a very essential part I missed. Well, I always say that the ear is a better editor than the eye. Yeah. And there's probably reasons, scientific reasons, why yeah, that's yeah, the definitely. case. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now you still see yourself as being in the process of trying to become a better writer. For sure. Yeah. And I feel like I just woke up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so how have you communicated that to your students in terms of practical advice, like what they should do? Um, I, I told yeah. them about this book yeah. first, right? <laughs> and then I felt like when I correct their writing, uh -huh. um, it's, I, I always emphasize the, the big picture and then um, did you try your best actually to uh, make your audience spend the minimal effort uh, to read your work? Did you put the known, func known not information first and then put the new information second? Did you, um, you know, all those basic rules this book uh, mentioned, right? So basically make them not struggle, have to read twice to, to understand what you try to say. So I think just kind of structure changes, sentence changes, and also the emphasize. Uh, a lot of times about moving around the world. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I, I start to do this with them. Well, and I think you now have fun with it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Definitely. And treating sentences as, sort as of yeah, like puzzles. what you're, as, yeah. yeah, exactly. It, it's starting to be lively on the paper, right? So I can move around, and then by moving them around, actually, completely sending out. Maybe in your own head, it's the same idea, but completely have a different impact on your readers. And, and I think that's the part I didn't realize before. Um, and, and then on that note, I also feel like, we discussed this a little bit, mm -hmm. I also feel like, uh, um, I think Steven Pinker also mentioned mm -hmm. that, um, you know, ultimately, the clarity of your thought, um, probably the best demonstration is through your writing, right? How clear your writing is. So in a way, this is a two-way two conversation to yourself. Um, you know, your thought process get uh, purified or clarified through writing. And then your writing try to recapitulate the clear thought, right? So kind of going back and forth. Um, so I felt like uh, in a way, this process actually help you to force you uh, make your thought more clear, more logical. Well, the idea of using writing as a technology yeah. to help you structure your thought. Exactly. And Obviously, writing is a very ancient technology, um, many thousands of years, but mm -hmm. it's a good technology, yeah. <laughs> and it actually does have effects. I don't, I don't know that there's actually been scientific research on how writing works in the brain. Yeah, language yeah. or writing. I think maybe I, I'm, yeah. I'm not familiar with, but I think it's definitely something I'm really interested in. Yeah. I feel like it's a two different bring area communicating. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious about this. You've talked about your awareness of, of nature and the wilderness and a curiosity about how things work. So it's a long way from that to the blood brain barrier. Yeah. And also your work is very special in that it draws from multiple disciplines. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about the challenges of working at that boundary between disciplines and, and tell them a little bit about that boundary? Hmm. Okay, yeah, so, so I think, um, so first of all, you have to um, communicate with two different fields, right? So I'm going to meetings to vascular field and also I'm going to meetings in neuroscience field. Um, so, uh, so I'm trying to bridge this too. Um, so the communication also become even more important because um, there are certain things. So, so when you give a talk or or um, give a seminar, you you have to make sure the background is very clearly presented. So I think does it have a even more uh, higher requirement for the clarity of your your um, research to, to, um, to others uh, because you have to pretend you're talking to people 
not necessarily very, very exactly on your on your field. Um, and um, another thing is there's no like a clear path. So in a way, I actually really like that. There's more room to be creative, to be you know kind of a you can decide like which direction you want to go to. So that's related to a little bit like clarity of your thinking. Um, there's a, maybe five directions you can go, right? Same thing as when you planning your writing. Um, there's five ways you can tell the story, right? Like what, uh, what is the one that you feel most interesting, impactful, and, and important? And that's the one you're going to go. So I, f I felt like there's more room to, to, uh, to think about. Um, yeah. You've mentioned several times the importance of story in your work and mm -hmm. telling, telling an impactful story. Could you possibly unpack one story from your own research to explain how you turned it into an impactful piece of research? <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> That's a hard question. That's a hard question. Yeah. yeah. Just maybe through the drafting process, how you sharpened it to yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's definitely. Um, I, I also feel like uh, it's always good to start early um, when when you when you're thinking about oh, maybe in six months I'm going to send out this manuscript. But I think it's the earlier the better because through writing you actually realize uh, <coughs> there's still a hole actually required more experiment to be done. Um, so that's why I think it's a two way. Um, conversation so because of the writing is actually exposed there's a gap of logic or a gap of your knowledge right uh, otherwise you know you just everything inside your head you probably didn't even realize that um, so I fall like um, the it, it's, it's a process um, when you when you're doing this mm -hmm. writing and then you realize and then you do more experiment and mm -hmm. your experiment could give you a completely surprising result um, so, so our, our latest paper is like that, and then uh, your new result forces you to um, rethink about your hypothesis, right? And then that will change the writing. So in the end, always better, uh, I, I felt. Uh, so, so that's maybe more, it's not like repacking or anything, it's more about, you know, your writing and your thinking and your experiment kind of uh, go hand in hand, and then in the end, um, it's make your whole case more enriched, uh, more well thought, uh, cover more base, and your conclusion more sounded. And also, um, also during this process, you're you should allow yourself very be, be very open minded. Um, if um, if something leave room for surprises, right? Don't lock yourself into some kind of a pre-existing hypothesis or premises. Um, I think that will always end up in a very surprising and, and exciting I think thing. leaving room for surprises is really at the heart of intellectual mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. and leaving room for surprises means in terms of writing making time to surprise yourself yeah. so when the first of these conversations earlier this year with Dean Mung, which yeah, you've seen, I, yeah. the the number one thing that Dean Mung says about writing is take your time. Yes. And it seems like a really simple piece of advice, but yeah. when you, particularly when you're doing coursework, it's very hard to take yeah. your time because you don't have a lot of time. Yeah. But if you if you do take the time, you're going to get the kinds of rewards that you're mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think it's a, it was, I can share this with you guys. Um, it was a mental block for me before. I, I just felt like, oh my God, I have this big writing assignment to do. And, uh, you know, it's kind of procrastinating or something, right? But after you actually dissect out, you know what you, get yourself into, right? You know there should be a series of steps. Then you kind of uh, looking forward. You're not so scared anymore because before it was like a mountain in front of yourself, right? Now it's a dissected to 10 steps. So you know, oh, next week I'm just going to take this little step 
it's not scary anymore. And also you know for each step what your your goal is, right? The first step is just writing whatever I want to write down, right? So that's not so scary. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm looking for a perfect published, um, you know, final draft, right? So I think that helped me a lot. It's giving yourself freedom and permission at the beginning and then giving yourself the time to use that freedom well to develop the discipline and to heighten the impact. Yeah. Um, so if you had, if you were to write your own book called Style, <laughs> like Style Part Two, yeah. um, what would be the, the most important thing that you would want to say to graduate students in the sciences about writing? Mm, I, I still think clarity, direct and concise probably the most important thing. And, and, and basically the goal is to make your audience literally spend the minimal effort. I, I think for brain, I'm, myself as a neuroscientist, right? So I think there is a rule, like a minimal effort rule for your brain. Unconsciously, your brain always tend to spend minimal effort. Um, so I think for reader to avoid unnecessary struggle, I think if you if you when you're writing, pretend once a while you are the reader, and ask yourself, "Have I achieved this goal?" That will be a good feedback mechanism. Well, you're trying to create something transparent where yeah. the meaning is just coming through, and there isn't any resistance in yeah. the language. It's just like looking through a window; you see something clearly if it's clean. Yeah. You're just trying to have a clean window version yeah. of the writing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the clean transparent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I want to leave as much time as possible for question yeah, and answers. I think so I'd rather have yeah, more, no, like more conversation. Yeah. So please ask questions. And I hope that you have now learned that it's okay to be in Chenghua's position and you still feel like you're learning and it's like uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> you may find it hard to believe, but far into adulthood, you still think, oh, how do I do this thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, also, we just had this conversation, yeah. right? I think li learning should be a lifetime yeah. thing. It should always teach yourself new things, right? Yeah. So for me, unfortunately, writing is the, English writing mm -hmm. is the biggest uh, obstacle. And it's also something I really now very looking forward to improve. Um, so I think everyone have different things you want to improve or you're very enjoying doing it, right? So uh, it's fine. Well, there's that cliched and perhaps inaccurate saying that the Chinese character that means danger is the same character for opportunity. Oh, <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Yeah. You can turn everything into positive things. It's right? true. Yeah. It's true. So I'm going to turn to questions. So please ask Chenghua questions about your writing or writing in general or academic life more generally, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Chris? All right. Um, thank you very much, Chenghua. Um, I had a question. So this, this phrase that you repeated a couple of times about minimal effort and this concept of, so I definitely understand what you mean by making the writing as clear as possible so the reader can understand it and it's transparent. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the, this, there's a line there because like ancient poets and going all the way back to Greek tradition and then to Latin and then into Renaissance when poetry died, just kidding, um, <laughs> at least for me, they would say that in fact that it's the knowledge embedded within the poetry that you have to work for, this is yeah. where allegory comes from, is what makes it worth the effort and that's where you really get knowledge. Yeah. Um, and obviously that doesn't apply to, to science necessarily that you want it to be clear and communicated clearly. But I'm, I'm curious about in today's society how everything is about speed and blogging and, and minimal effort, that there has to be a point where the reader, if putting in no effort at all, is doesn't even invest his or her brain in order to properly comprehend like, mm -hmm. the depth of, of mm -hmm. the subject that you're writing on. And obviously, you're writing on very important things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about that line. Like, How do you make sure that the yeah. reader is still invested, and yet it's easy enough for yeah. understanding? Uh, I felt like there's two levels. What, what I'm trying to achieve every time I ask myself is that the, the idea 
or the knowledge or whatever you want to offer, right? Either your ideas or something you discovered, that has to be in depth. That has to be novel, that has to be insightful, has to be important. Um, there's something worth to share, right? So it's something like uh, really uh, insightful. Um, but the language itself, I felt like as simple, as direct, as concise as possible. So, so basically more like uh, people register, say, oh, now I understand, or say, oh, this is really important, this is really intriguing, I have never thought about this before. I mean, I realized that when I read uh, the books mm -hmm. I was reading, right, like uh, I felt like uh, my struggle wasn't at the level of language, but it's more like uh, um, I might listen to this twice, right, because it's not like I don't understand the word, it's more about, oh, this is re make me think about my own experience and make me realize, oh, this is really a very important point. So I think that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, but I agree with you. I think, uh, I think it is kind of interesting, right? Like, uh, you know, Shakespeare, you know, back then, you know, all those type of writing require mental <laughs> exercises. But nowadays, it, it, that we can discuss about this forever, <laughs> right? Like, uh, it's true. Um, but I felt like, uh, you know, of course, the, the ideas and the, the new things has to be there. I mean, that's the purpose why we need to communicate. Uh, it just the vehicle itself seems like uh, you have to make it simpler or something. Well, there's a way in which clarity is the condition of complexity, because in order to understand the ways in which something is complex, you have to see them clearly expressed. So it's this paradox of the, the relationship. I, within English itself, I love complicated texts, but I wonder if that's because I'm used to reading literature yeah. and so on, and I have fun with it, and it's more entertaining for me if it's complicated. Um, but uh, this is where there's a really interesting area of difference between science and the humanities, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Another question, Chris? You said you were going to ask multiple ones. Yeah, no, that's a great one. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you for your lecture. Um, my question may be more related with the writing thing since we talked about it this evening. Um, because uh, when you said that uh, when we were writing not in our mother language, we used to mimic, mimic the essays that publish the essays that yeah. we write. Um, I came up with a problem. For example, I was writing in discussion and uh, a professor, uh, sorry, uh, for some uh, words that I used uh, uh, in other papers, um, I, I usually find that I can come up with a better word to to replace it or to paralyze the sentence mm -hmm. that I want to express, similar meaning. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure how to solve this kind of problem, because sometimes I, I don't know if I, um, certainly it's, it's kind of like a, um, you want to come up with another word, but you just <laughs> Mm -hmm. Can't think of a better word. Right, but you're still in the stage you try to mimic the yeah. sentence structure yeah. or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think if you just throw the, all of those out, right? Just get a, you know, start from a blank screen. Just use your own language. Just pretend you're talking with me, right? Write down your thought process for, uh, write down, for example, bullet point of the discussion, right? You feel like there's five things that should be discussed. Just use a plain language to write down this one, two, three, right? And then, uh, finish, you know, those kind of a um, simple bullet point first, and then started to just use your own language, start to elaborate, to explain that, right? And then just go to work. So, so just don't, just forget about this m modeling after the, yeah. Like, that would be my advice. It, it, it's a slow process though, and the thing is, if you are searching for a word and you don't have it, I will say, as a, a native speaker of English, one of the resources that I still use to this day is the thesaurus. 
And if you go in a thesaurus, if you go to thesaurus.com, quite literally, and you enter in a word that you already know, it will show you words that mean something similar to what you want to say. And part of the reason I enjoy writing so much is there are occasions when I, I still need new words. And I enjoy reading the definitions and saying, oh, that, that's it. That's that tiny little edge of what I wanted to say. So knowing that using dictionaries and thesauruses in particular, that's a great way to learn new words. And you can find something. There'll usually be a list of about 30 words that mean something similar to what you're looking for. And you can then decide, and in the process, you will have learned several new words. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a good point. I, I felt like that's another thing. My vocabulary was not as high as, you know, in order to have this uh, diversity of your sentences and different way of writing, you also need a certain amount of vocabulary, right? So, so now I have a habit, basically, even from listening bo to books also help you a lot. And then in addition, any opportunity I learn some new words, I actually put on my list of the new vocabulary. And then you can try to use it. So I think that's definitely very important um, it's, aspect. It's a long process. And yeah. the thing is, English is a very complicated language because it's from so many different sources. And I'm sure I can speak for the native speakers here in saying that you continually learn new words. Um, I often look up words I don't know. And I sort of am proud of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so knowing that it's this long, complicated process that native speakers are going through as well, it's, it's a very natural part of it. And I don't get the words that I want the first time around either. And then I have to really tinker with it and work a lot in order to get it to say what I want it to say. That's good to know even for yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I also have a question about vocabulary. So, mm -hmm. um, like as a non-native speaker, mm -hmm. as time goes by, you actually can build a huge vocabulary, but mm -hmm. for some of the words, there are nuances that I mm -hmm. cannot catch. So, like, sometimes uh, for native speaker, they know what's the exact word to use, but for mm -hmm. me, I could only choose between, like, two or three, but I don't know which one is the best. Yeah. So um, how do you tackle with that problem? I felt like it's, it's, it's like Suzanne said, it's a long process, right? You cannot achieve that some magic bullet. I feel like if you continue to read or listen, from in my case, um, I felt very helpful, basically, because you kind of, uh, you have to learn the vocabulary in, in its own setting, right? So the best example to learn how to use it or which one's better is by listening or by reading a lot of examples, it, it, it was how it was used. And then you will have a sense, you know, why this is a perfect location, perfect uh, situation to use this particular vocabulary. So I felt like uh, for that is really um, hard work, I guess you just have to build, um, accumulating your, your um, vocabulary or your... It's very tedious yeah. and this is why using the thesaurus, is a, it's a very valuable resource. It also takes a long time because if you're looking at a list of 30 words and they all mean something similar but with these slight nuances, then in order to find the one that has the nuance that you want, you have to read all the definitions. And that's just part of the process, unfortunately. If you use and you all have access to the Oxford English Dictionary through Hollis. The great thing about the Oxford English Dictionary is it gives you quotations where you can see the words being used. So you can get a more nuanced understanding of what a particular word means in context. And they also give examples of the first use of the word to the most recent use of the word. So you get a very elaborate sense of mm -hmm. 
these are the 15 different ways in which this word has been used historically. So Oxford English Dictionary, it's called, uh, the abbreviation is the OED. Um, I'm sorry to say that as a teenager, it was one of my favorite books to read. Because uh, <laughs> I was a very boring teenager, and yes, I did read the dictionary for entertainment. Yes. <laughs> For sharing, sure. I totally relate to uh, most of your story. And, um, for a lot of your conversation, you mentioned to start as early as possible in the process of writing and take your time in writing. But fortunately, as a Harvard student, we usually don't have time because we have to attend amazing events like this. Yeah, we have to save time for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I guess my question is, if we are in crunch time, how do we? tips for speeding up the process. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I felt like when I'm on my bike or something, you know, just to kind of uh, contemplating the, your, your, your strategy, how you're going to write it, the flow, uh, do some kind of preparation um, in, you know, while you're on the treadmill or jogging or something else. Um, that also helps. Um, but still, I think the sooner you just give a quick draft and then start to work on it, I think that's probably the, the best. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I wish I know well, the answer. Well, I would also say that as GSAS students, you all have access to the Center for Writing and Communicating Ideas, and you're very welcome to send me or another tutor articles in your field. I will read them, or my colleagues will read them, and we will meet with you to explain how they are structured and how you should be putting these things together according to the published scholarship in your field that, that you think is important. And then what that means in terms of your own process is you go into it having an idea about what you want to do and a clearer set of expectations. and. I would say the worry about using the exact precise word is that, I hate to say this, can be sacrificed if need be. Mm -hmm. If you have to use a boring word that you've used before, it's not the end of the world. And if you simply do not have time, it's better to use a word that you know already. Um, so if you have to sacrifice the sort of literary rhetorical quality just to get the thing in on time and to, to communicate more clearly the science, then the good news is if it's a good enough paper, it will likely turn into an article. And that means it's going to go through countless <laughs> versions and there will be world enough in time for you to improve it once it's a really solid piece of scientific writing. So I would say if forced to make sacrifices, you know, make it boring, make it the language predictable, and then fix it later. So what, what, what is your bottleneck, you feel? What is the re limiting factor? You mentioned you feel like you wish you could do this faster, right? Mm -hmm. But just think about your own writing. What do you feel like is the rate limiting factor? Is the perfection part or is the actual, mm -hmm. um, actual, you know, design, the logic, you know, the structure, like basically you felt like what, what is the most time consuming step for you? Right, because I think that's a very interesting question. Like you mentioned, when you write, you tend to put everything out first, like yeah. a conversation with yourself. But, because yeah. uh, I, was an English teacher, and a lot of the strategies we teach the students like think it through first before you write. Mm -hmm. So we have an 80 20 like ratio, yeah. you should spend 80 is an exaggeration, but we, we will emphasize that you should spend more time planning than you think you need to. Uh -huh. So it's very interesting how you yeah. say, huh. you just jump in and start writing, yeah. and then you come back and fix, fix it later. Yeah. So the most time-consuming part is to maybe I should spend more time 
on the treadmill and think it through. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think part of this is about reimagining the relationship between thinking and writing and realizing that writing is not very far removed from thinking. It's simply the public face of our own thinking. When we're putting together a sentence with our hands, whether we're typing or writing, that is our thinking. And so you, the, the fact that you're putting it down in front of you is simply making your thought visible. And that's where the idea of using writing as the technology to structure the thinking comes in. So that if you get everything out, you can see for yourself what you have to work with. And it's always easier to revise the words that have already come out of you, that are in front of you, than it is to come up with some perfect idea in your head. And just by virtue of being a graduate student here, everyone has perfectionist tendencies. We all would like to write very well. I myself would like to write very well. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a continual work in progress, but I can't see what I need to improve until I get it out in front of me because I can't read my own mind. Because I think my the advice I got before also same as what you mentioned, you know, basically spending a lot of time contemplating in your head like what exactly everything, you know. But but the problem is, um, you could run in circles, waste a lot a lot of time. Versus if you force yourself right on the paper, you're not going to write the same thing 500 times, right? You you each time you're definitely improving something. It's visible. I think and also boil down in the end is a communication, right? It doesn't matter what, how wonderful it seems like inside your head. In the end, it's what on the paper, the one serve the role to communicate with others. Uh, so I felt like uh, the sooner you put on the paper probably. Well, that's going to be the voice of your science. Yeah. And the thing is, I think we all have the illusion when we're going to write something that oh, I, I sort of know in my mind what I want to do, but I'll just let it sit there for a while until it's perfect, and then I'll, I'll put it down on paper. And the thing is, if you don't have the evidence in front of you on the page of what you know, you may think you know a lot more or a lot less than you do. And the best indicator in terms of self-knowledge about how well the project is going is what you're able to actually put on the page. Yeah. And so it's this constant like generating illusions and then bursting the balloon. <laughs> Other questions? Um, yeah, and then you. Okay. Go ahead. Um, thank you for your talk and sharing. And uh, my question is, since uh, I'm not uh, the since the English is not my first language, mm -hmm. um, I think in the usually cases when I'm going to write a thing, and there are some sentence, but it's in like Chinese and in my mind, mm -hmm. and I'm try trying to translate it into the English. Mm -hmm. But in this case, is um, like. Um, the sentence is not going to be short and clear enough. It's, um, I will make a sentence into more complicated, and I think it's yeah not necessary. So yeah, yeah, that, I think that's a typical problem. Yeah. Even if you don't think, like for me, it's like bilingual, right? Naturally, I don't really think in Chinese, but that's not a problem. It's because you don't have the skills how to okay. how to express yourself in a simpler structure mm -hmm. because you don't you don't hear enough. I felt like uh, after I listening to all those books, uh, you just you have this uh, instinct now. You know, like uh, there's a there's a much easier way to express yourself. Uh, you can use like five words instead of like five sentences, right? So I think that that that's some kind of a um, well, skill. Well, I would say give yourself permission to write the five complicated sentences, and really 
it's the same process as when you're trying to do some kind of exercise that your muscles are not equipped to do. Let yourself go through that phase where your muscles are hurting and say, okay, if I have to write five sentences and throw four of those five sentences away mm -hmm. and, and then yeah. carve out the one sentence that seems to make some sense, that's okay. And so again, just to return to the point that we keep making, let yourself write pretty much whatever you want at first. Um, I know that some people write in their native language first and then translate. If, if that's a process that is, is working for you and you feel that your, your writing is improving through that process, then let yourself do it. Um, the goal is to find a process that works for you. There isn't a predetermined model that works apart from what works for you. But imperfection is desirable. Um, and it's what we all start with. Yeah. Yeah, I guess to, I think that's a good suggestion. It's a hard work, like shrink the five sentences to like five words. Um, right? I probably write about 100 pages for every 20 pages I keep. And that means I write a lot. And there are some people in this room who have seen me write and they know that I write a lot. They can testify to the fact that if I want to get one sentence that I like, that may take me 10 pages of just terrible stuff. And frankly, that hasn't changed. I have a PhD in English. It doesn't change. So, so let yourself take, take the time that you need. Um, you had a question? Yeah. yeah. So first of all, thank you for the talk. I actually have a, a comment to re reply to some of the other questions, and then also yeah. a question to you. So also, as I like, think it relates to what you were asking right now, and also what you were asking before. So also, as not an, a, a non-native English speaker, I sometimes have like the same problem. Like, okay, is this phrasing something that people actually use, or is, did I just make it up in my head or trans <laughs> translate it from Hebrew? So one thing that I usually do, uh, I don't know if it's a common strategy, but I like open a Google Chrome tab, start writing the sentence, and if it autocompletes, that's a good sign. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if it, if it doesn't, then you look it up, and sometimes it gives you the right way to, to say it. <laughs> that's true. You can yeah. use Google Books for that, too. If you put oh. the phrase in quotation marks, yeah. and there are no instances of it in all of Google Books, chances are it is not idiomatic. And you basically use Google Book as a little testing device yeah. until you get to the phrase that is idiomatic. Right. Yeah, and uh, for the question, you mentioned that you, you know, spent a big portion of your childhood in Mongolia, and I assume that during that time you probably learned some Mongolian? No. no? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, um, I actually didn't see many native Mongolian people. Uh, because it's a research institute, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, anyway, I didn't. Uh, I see. Well, my question was going to be, do you think that, you know, being bilingual affected your ability to learn English later as a new third language? Uh, actually, in a way, I, I know, um, for example, you know, my, my uh, dad's side is from Shanghai. Shanghai has a Shanghai dialect, which is very different. I just remember when I was nine years old, I spent like a whole, maybe six months living Shanghai, right? I mean, the lifestyle, everything is completely different from in the Mongolia. The language is completely different. So I just, uh, you know, nine years old, you can pick it up very quickly, right? So I thought that experience, in many ways, helped me a lot when I came to the U.S. Um, I, I know it's, it's no big deal. It just, uh, you know, there's people who speak different languages and have different lifestyles, and like, so, so I feel like it's it's put me in the ease a little bit. Um, yeah, maybe that experience, yeah. You're trying to recapture that sort of plasticity of mind that lets children yeah. acquire yeah. languages quickly. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's harder. No, no, than no, your brain has changed. It's hard. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's harder than when you were nine years yeah. old. Yeah.
Um, Other questions? Um, are people working on pieces of writing right now that they're struggling with? Or everything's going beautifully for everyone in this room? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, one more question for Jen Lott. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, so, I'm just curious to your thoughts on like uh, an issue I have sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, like I read a lot of papers, and especially like papers not in my field, like when I mm -hmm. get really bored. And I have trouble separating quality of writing from the quality of science. Mm -hmm. So everyone I know in my lab mm -hmm. who's a good writer mm -hmm. is also a good scientist. Mm -hmm. Then I, I know actually a couple people who are good scientists who are not. Mm -hmm. that great mm -hmm. writers and mm -hmm. you know I, have, I only have so much time yeah. to read all these papers so yeah. sometimes you know I might I might read a paper and the writing's not good so I get frustrated and yeah. I mm -hmm. don't read it as carefully or yeah. so I, I was just curious to your thoughts is, is there is there any correlation between quality of science and writing and how do you sort of wade through yeah I kind of agree with you I think unfortunately I, I don't necessarily think that there there are correlation I, I think the way I see it more like um, you can, I think it's a shame if you are a good scientist and then you couldn't, you're not a good writer because then you just basically um, preventing people to appreciate your science, right? So it's a shame, I feel. Um, and, uh, but, but I don't, but I, I still respect those people's science, right? Like, um, so I think, um, on the other hand, you know, sometimes you see um, the writing is great or something, but you know, the, you can see through it, right? The science not necessary. You know, th some people just it's good it's in clear, selling. Clearly bad. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right, exactly. It could be completely opposite, right? It could be mm -hmm. clearly bad, and then it just uh, very smooth, whatever. But the substance is not there, right? So I think. We all thrive to have both, right? You have the substance, you also have the best way, the clearest way to, to communicate it. Um, I think that's what I, I think, I hope all of you, the reason you're here is also, that's the goal you try to achieve, I think. Well, there's no reason you can't have both. Also, it's, if your science is really good, issues in terms of just the mere correctness of the language are not going to prevent anyone from seeing how good it is. If it, like, if the issue is, oh, I don't know when to say the or uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't matter and someone's going to be able to see the quality of the science. The issue of the clarity in the writing is really about what Cheng Hua has been saying about you're trying to communicate the value of the science specifically through the way that it's written so that the writing is the vehicle for the goodness of the science yeah and how would you know otherwise and you would have to dig for it and she's saying okay I don't want people to have to dig to see that my work is good I want it to be seamless I want it to be transparent and I want it to have a lot of labor-saving devices built into it. Yes. Because people don't like to work. Yeah. 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 That's why I recommend this book, right? Because I think I'm not talking about you have to be like a fancy writer or all of this, right? You just want it to uh, offer very clear, uh, transparent, direct um, way of uh, expressing your science, right? So, so then they can see this is a... They, 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 they don't have to make actual effort to see if this is a great piece of science. Yeah. You had another question? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I just, um, I'm also a bilingual, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, so you talked about, we've well, talked about some hurdles you have to jump to achieve good writing in a foreign language, but is there any benefit to be writing in a foreign language as a non native? Do you think there are only downsides and there are all there are no benefit as a person who speaks another language? Right. 
I always think it's a benefit, right? Because first of all, your brain holding like a two different world, right? Two different type of languages, right? Um, mm. Working in another language builds synapses. It's, <laughs> no, it's a known thing. Yeah. It's the best way you can grow brain tissue is to work in a language first that's not your own, and secondly, that has a different alphabet. It's the Chinese and English is like yeah. completely foreign. No, language, it's right? for yeah. elderly people who want to keep their brain tissue active. They learn, learn actually yeah. different languages. Yeah. Yeah. No, so there are huge cognitive benefits. Also, it's been demonstrated empirically that children who yeah. are bilingual yeah. have much more rapid communication yeah. between the spheres yeah. of their brain. Yeah. I, yeah. it's, it's just very different. It's more like, okay, you see an object, it's chair, right? So you have yizi and chairs simultaneously pop out, right? I, I don't do any translation, right? I'm sure you're the same way. Um, so I felt like, uh, yeah, if you can challenge yourself to express in English terms in the, just like the natives, I think it's something good to your brain. <laughs> Well, also, the more work that your brain, we've talked a lot about the value of, of saving labor for other people, but the more labor you do yourself, the better your brain is going to get mm -hmm. at its basic problem solving capacity. And it's like exercise. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, I, I do feel like it's like exercises, right? It's basically you do the work for your readers. Yeah. Um, to, to make your own thought process so very clear. So don't spare yourself labor. Like you do all the labor and let your readers have this lovely, pleasurable experience of yeah. reading beautiful stuff. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's my revelation, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like yourself understood something. It's like how you make other people understand it. Yeah, and I will also say that when all of you start teaching, the same work that you do in working on your writing to reach your readers is going to be the kind of work that you're doing in order to speak to your students because you have so much complicated material that you want to communicate to your students and if you were to communicate it to them in the way that you understand it they would run screaming out of the room so you have to create a sort of highway on ramp for them to get on the mm -hmm. highway so then they can start moving. Yeah. 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 Um, any final questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for letting me listen in. But uh, I was wondering uh, do you think if you were English was your first native language, would you become a better writer? I, I assume. <laughs> I like to think. Well, I like to or, think that way. Or is it the fact that your life experiences have helped you create your own style, right? Yeah, I also agree with that too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say that there are plenty of native speakers who are terrible yeah. writers. Yeah absolutely terrible and I've certainly generated my share of terrible writing in this world and the thing is you can always change it and it's like whatever level of fitness you're at any any given time if you decide to move more you're going to be able to move more so you create the capability by doing the thing you're not very good at doing um, so I, and again, people who are working in multiple languages are doing something that's about 10 times harder than what native speakers are doing. So it's frankly much more impressive. Um, <laughs> and yeah, um, so you know, you start where you are with what you have to work with um, and you make the best of it and push it as far as you can and also Chenghua has spoken very movingly about how exposing yourself to literature, whether through it's, it's through audiobooks or reading, mm -hmm. um, is, is hugely important because if you get the sound of good English syntax in your head, your brain's going to do some of the work for you. Yeah. It's a little bit like learning piano, right? So if you're like uh, five years old, you start to learn piano, you don't remember you make 
effort, right? You just grow like this. Plus, yeah. plus you have advantage. Uh, you, you're plus. You're more plastic. You have, you know, reach your critical period. But versus adult, you decided to learn piano. You clearly every single step is a, is a, is effort, right? Translate into effort. So I think that's a little bit similar to what we are going through. Um, well, writing in a language that's a second language is like riding a bike up a very steep hill and you're basically <laughs> out of breath a lot, but it's good. You're building muscles, so it's all worth it. Less intuitive is all, it's, it's definitely um, need effort, conscious yeah. effort. Yeah. You know, you, you have like a slow thinking, fast thinking, right? So there's definitely a slow thinking process. It's, I will yeah. say as, as a native speaker of English, I will occasionally, if I'm completely blocked and I don't know what I want the sentence to say, um, I will try and write it in another language, which in my case would be French, because I want to see mm -hmm. what it is I'm trying to say apart from the fact that I have a large English vocabulary to draw from, and that sometimes is a luxury so that I'm making it sound good without it saying anything. Yeah. And so, oh, I see. Yeah. Interesting. Huh? Yeah. So I will actually try and draw my ideas using lines and shapes so that I can have an abstract sense of what does this idea look like. I will use French. I will drink glasses of wine. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> there is nothing I will not do because mm -hmm. it's a constant struggle. Um, any final questions, observations, que advice needed, anything? Well, thank you all so much for coming. It's yeah. great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.